Oh, yep. there I am. Gotcha. <laughs> Welcome, Joe. Welcome. The St. Joseph County Council to order. A couple of announcements before we get going here. The presentation on the Douglas Road bond has been postponed until November meeting, and Bill number 59-24 is being held at the request of the petition. With that said, we're ready to begin. We will start with our first committee, which is Budget Administration. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bill number 113-24A, appropriation of $903,616. Okay. I thought Bree was going to. She's not here, but I can speak on it if you. I think I'm pretty much. The woodland. The woodland. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, settlement for the fire, final damages on the fire at Woodland. Worked, we especially worked very hard on getting every claim made and uh, got a good settlement. Uh, Without, and I will ask you how much more you thought. Oh, um, I don't know what the original estimate was. She did not provide that with me. It, um, the original estimate was that. It's 2.3 million adjustment. Uh, it came to 2.2 million. So, yeah, so this additional appropriation of 903,000 and some odd change here is for three vehicles. Um one uh one tandem axle and two single axles. And just a reminder at the time of this um incident there was no vehicle or catastrophic insurance that would cover this. So this is coming out of the liability fund. So insure any questions? Um, I do not have that dollar amount, but I can tell you that we have we have substantial funds for it. $40,000 Yes, this was a, I believe, a transfer. I thought other people were going to be here to speak on this, but I'm here. I mean, this is a transfer. I, we have, so. I am here, Carl. If you need me to speak on it, it's Courtney. Sure. Courtney, why don't you speak on it? Thank yep. You. Yep. So it's a $40,000 transfer for unemployment claims. Um, this has happened the last number of years. Uh, we are budgeted just a little bit under what we are incurring as far as unemployment claims go. So uh, we are asking a transfer of $40,000. We don't anticipate that we are going to use all 40, but in speaking with John Murphy, we wanted to err to the side of caution and make sure that we were covered and have it um, you know, revert back at the end of the year versus us needing to come before council again for Sorry. unemployment. <laughs> Any questions for the motion? Seeing none. Excuse me. Second. Do I have a motion and a second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? 13 24 this to the full council in favor of the Bill number 113-24C transfer of $382,730. Commissioner. Well, Sky Matters, Department of Infrastructure <laughs> Planning and Growth, uh, office on the 7th floor. Uh, what this transfer is for is for um, the beginning of leases for next year for our enterprise rentals for our pickup trucks for the highway. Um, we have about, I want to say, 29 of those that they use for various tasks, snow plowing. Um, that just runs a gambit, and they're very important to our fleet. This number, uh, I thought that this number was in going to be in lit, and I meant to put it there when we did the budget, but it didn't get put in there. So what we're asking to uh, to do is to 
move this from uh, the Alexander Garage Project Number One uh, ARP funds to the uh, to the, um, the 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 account that's shown on the I don't have the exact account, um, so that we can use that to pay those leases next year. Uh, if they didn't come out of that fund, we would have had to. Well, let me let me backtrack. The Alexander Project One um, came in um, under the estimated budget that we thought. So these are funds that are there. Um, keep in mind, we still have the Alexander Project Phase Two, which is the bigger phase of that uh, to come up. And uh, but by moving them using ARP money for those funds, what that does is that makes it so I don't have to use my LRSA account and take an additional 382,000 out of next year's paving budget. So Sky, to just to clarify, your L LRSA fund was short. It was, or couldn't hold that 382,000 for fleet allocation. It could have. It okay. But but you but your concern was that it was going to be taking away funding for paving, correct? Yeah. Okay. And so because of the Alexander Road Garage project coming in under what you anticipated, the ARP funds were doing this transfer of for the ARP funds to then cover the 2025 expenses of your fleet allocation. Yes. Okay. Explain that a lot better than okay. she's the best. <laughs> Perfectly okay with the uh, state board and everyone. Yes, it just needs council approval because since the original allocation for the ARP fund was to go directly to the Alexander Road Garage project, this is just, we need your approval so that these funds, the three hundred eighty-two thousand, is no longer going to be an Alexander Road project. It's going to go to the operating leases for the fleet management. Understand it. Okay, I'm just saying. Sometimes we get these little minor notations. Oh, that's what I'm referring to. So. No, it yes, it you we can do this. Yeah. And the the feds are going to have no problem with this doing this with the ARP. That's that's right. No, that's you're, exactly not gonna, yeah. you're not going to yeah. You're not going to have any issues. Um, just I'm, to, I'm just asking. No, yeah, no, that's a valid question. It's a good question. Okay. Um, just a reminder, we are we do have a substantial amount of ARP funds that go to fleet management. Um, and they will be used next year as well for the leases. Uh, we just need to make sure that any kind of changes that happen in ARP or any that anything that's not encumbered, everything needs to be encumbered by the end of this year. So any kind of cleaning up or tidying up, it needs to happen quickly. Yeah. I just want to add the mix up, which is all my fault, is was because the lease is ended in this year and they start next year, and I get I realize that and take that into account. I, I wasn't telling the lease. We got the lease, but I didn't look that up. So that's all. Have to answer any other questions or any other questions. Add anything up. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say aye. Bill number 113-24C goes to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Bill number 113-24D, appropriation of $20,881.06. Clerk. Uh, yes, Amy Rolf is clerk of the circuit court. My office is in the basement of courthouse one. Um, this is a grant that we will we have been awarded from the Secretary of State's office to upgrade our equipment for absentee um, technology. And um, we... We were successful with that grant, and so this is uh, this is to accommodate that. Any questions for the petition? I just want to tell you that you know I, I voted early, and a lot of people have told me that this is really fabulous. Thank you. And it got out rather quickly. Yeah. Very happy with that. Right. I see no question. No motion. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say aye. 
Article number 113-24D goes to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. If I can just uh, piggyback on what Sky was saying. Sky, yes. the highway department, delivers all of the voting equipment, over a thousand pieces, um, to the different vote center locations. And, and I really am thankful for all the organization and all of that. So, yeah. All right, bill number 113-24E, appropriation of $64,700, assessor. Um, so Shannon Schock, Director of Operations with the County Assessor's Office. Um, just to let the council know, in June of 2023, the state passed a House Enrolled Act, it's called 1454, that um, amended a very specific part of the Indiana Code, it's Section 9, that requires a land study to be performed countywide every four years. Currently, the county assessor's office, we don't have the staffing requirements um, in place to meet that land order requirement. So the form D before you today is basically just to um, pay for contractual services that we've entered with a third party vendor to fulfill that requirement. And we set up the sales disclosure fund in 2024 to cover that. So this is just allowing us to meet those contractual payments. Motion. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those same sign. Bill number 113 24D. Favorable yes. recommendation. Back to you, President. Thank you, Mr. Sheffield. Well, next up is the Engineering and Transportation Committee, Mr. Donna. Um, <clears throat> I am unprepared. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. Bill number uh, is it one thirteen dash twenty four F appropriation of one million five hundred thousand department oh six nine IPG Guy Matters Department of Infrastructure Planning and Growth again what this is is this is the one point five million dollars that we were awarded in twenty twenty four for the community crossings matching grant um, we're just we got the the money and we just need to appropriate it to the right account so I can. Get the contractors finish getting the contractors paid for the work they've done this year. So, any questions? Have to answer them. Questions? No questions. We have a motion on Bill Number One One Three Dash Twenty Four F. Damn, you're very good. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Motion to send favorably. <laughs> There, I hear you. I have a motion, a favorable motion, and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Next one here. Bill number 113-24G, appropriation $3,000. Department 061 IPG, Sky again. Uh, th what this appropriation is for what we're doing here is a uh... This is just an in out of line transfer that we're doing from one budget, uh, from a uh, administration budget to a supply account to cover the shortfall in the supply account. Questions? No questions. Can I have a motion? Motion is in favorably. Second. I have a motion, favorable motion, the second on 113 24 G. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Opposed? Bill number 113-24G goes to full council. And that is all I have, Mr. Root. Mr. Root, bill number 113-24H, a transfer of $4,000 for sheriff. Uh, Steve Noonan, executive officer for the police, St. Joe County Police Department offices at 401 West Sample. This is a transfer from the uh, education and conference fund into the computer fund. This is revenue that is generated by sex offenders that have to register annually. Um, this is going to be used to uh, purchase three new laptops for the investigators in that unit. Questions? Is there a motion? Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, bill number 11324H moves forward with a favorable recommendation. 
Bill number 11424, a salary amendment from the Department of Health combined with bill number 11324, transfer of $181,382.40. Commissioner? Yes. Hi, I'm Mike Rubel, Director of Operations for the Department of Health. Um, this amount represents, uh, we have applied for and we're granted a no cost extension for our uh, community health worker grant. Uh, and that will fund the eight community health worker uh, positions that are currently operating in 12 census tracts. Um, it basically will fund their salaries, uh, will be allowed to use the funds uh, that are left over in 2024 into 2025. Once that fund is exhausted, we'll move over to HFI funding for the remainder. Bye. Questions? Yeah. Mr. Shetson? You said eight workers? Yes, it's eight case workers. Okay. Right. Maybe it's my mistake here. I'm just looking at these numbers here. It looks like 16. Did I look at the front page of this? Got four at 38,900, four at 40,000. 800 for 41,100 and for 43,200. Am I? Um, yeah. yeah. That is just reading what their current salary is and then what the proposed oh, salary is. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Currently. Thank you. Anything else? Is there a motion? Just in favor of waiting. Perfect. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Opposed? Okay. Bill number 11424 combined with bill number 11324. I move forward with a favorable recommendation. Next bill is number 11524, a salary amendment with the prosecutor combined with bill number 11324J, an appropriation of $23,309.49. Operating the prosecutor's office on the 10th floor of this building. We're here to ask for an appropriation and salary amendment for funds received from Notre Dame for 10 part time students there that works in the cybercrime unit. Uh, they've already sent us the check and has been deposited into the fund account already. Uh, $23,309. Any questions? Is there a motion? Motion in favor, Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, bill number 11524 combined with bill number 11324J moves forward with a favorable recommendation. Lastly, bill number 11624, a salary amendment um, probate court combined with bill number 11324K, an appropriation of $450,450. Brenda Matthew Stavich, Executive Director of Costa Program of St. Joseph County. Uh, we have offices located at 1000 South Michigan Street. Uh, this is a grant that we've received for uh, four grant cycles now. We've received this grant since 2019. Um, it's a Victim of Crimes Act grant through the Indiana Office of Juvenile Justice, um, Indiana Criminal Justice Office, of various people combined. Um, it is a reimbursement grant. It is for two years. It started October 1 of 24, and it will end September 30th of 26. Um, this grant covers salary, benefit, all expenses for three staff people. And we have built into it uh, increases for the second year of it, which would be starting, what, October 1 of 25. Um, this grant does require a match. We've met that match by the guardian ad litem who does work for our program, who assists us legally. Can't think of anything else. Mr. Shutsky. I think we've all visited you. We know Casa does, but can you explain to someone who doesn't know what you do? Sure. Uh, we are the Court Appointed Special Advocate Program, and um, CASA is a national organization. We train volunteers who advocate for children that are in the foster care system. Um, Indiana has one of the largest networks of CASA programs. I think 88 counties out of the 92 have a CASA program. Our county is the fifth largest program in the state of Indiana. Um, we serve approximately 900 children per year. We have a small wait list right now just due to some staff turnover. Um, we've experienced some issues since COVID in um, getting volunteers to come into our fold. We're starting to increase those numbers, however. 
Um, and essentially, you know, we're, we're volunteer based, but in order to serve all the children that we're serving, it requires grants such as this, that we can pay staff to do a lot of that work too. Um, we would have a significantly large wait list without staff. Um, I just wrote a grant for the Indiana office of GAL CASA for 150,000. That will be for next year. That covers two people. This covers three without those five positions. That wait list would probably be astronomical. In the process of that, we still are doing everything that we possibly can to recruit, screen, train, obtain volunteers. Thank okay. You. Is there a motion? All those in favor? Opposed? The bill number 11624 combined with bill number 11324 came forward with a favorable amendment. Well, Mr. Root? Thank you. The plan, planning and we then request to deal with bill number 111 24. So, with that said, uh, Mr. Page? Bill so number 111 24, we will park located at 12746 and 12726 Continuing Highway. Petitioner Charles and Don Fuller. Uh, the petitioner here is going to be, uh, I'm, my name is Pete Augustino, 131 South Taylor Street. Diversified Real Estate, Mike Dobson here is the contingent buyer. We have consent from the owner, the Bullenbachers, to, to move forward with this. I don't know if you want to do your presentation first or. I can go through it quickly. Do you have any questions? All right, so this is a rezoning um, from single family to commercial property on the south side of the highway here for industrial uses as well as commercial uses. Um, it's surrounded by residential use on the east, west, and south. Most of those homes are accessed from smaller collector streets rather than off of Kinley. We are not happy today. Uh, site is currently vacant. This is what it looks like currently. Fire station is immediately across the street. Industrial uses to the west. There are residential uses abutting. Um, this is the one on to the east. And the other side, a residential home and a church. Site plan submitted by the petitioner. Um, they are meeting all requirements for setbacks from residential and providing landscaping on lot lines abutting residential user zoning. No outdoor storage um, would be permitted without a special use, and they are not seeking that. Um, staff has evaluated the petition against state law criteria and found that this would be an appropriate use given the surrounding area, compliance with development standards. At the hearing before the APC, one member of the public did speak in remonstrance. She is a neighbor that would abut the property to the west and had concerns about how it might be for residential home, including potential noise pollution and traffic from the loading docks. I'll let the petitioner speak to that further if needed. Otherwise, APC has sent this forward with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. I've got uh, some maps here that can pass around of my uh, color situation with respect to one of the models. Thanks. Yeah, that's and, and first of all, I just to give you a clue what's happening is my, my client has uh, is a developer that's working with my fellow Shulton uh, to build to uh, spec a facility uh, on McKinley for BW Cook heating and cooling. And we're looking at uh, moving a company over there with 93 employees currently to grow to about 110, maybe. Hopefully, uh, the facility would be a 20,000 square foot building. It would contain office space, a training center, and some warehouse space. The property that was there were the, the two homes at one time. Those have been demolished. There hasn't been any other development there. Because of its location in the area right across from the fire station and the access to McKinley, it's a, it's a very good location uh, for the company to relocate from Elkhart. Um, so 
the petitioner that spoke or the remonstrator that spoke is on the what would be on the south side of the property. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Real court. So it's, it's the one next to the one on the bottom, kind of. Uh, and their concern, I think, was about seeing uh, trucks come in and out. Uh, there is a delivery dock on the back side of the building that could be used a couple times a week. Uh, but the plan would be, in addition to the required screening that you see along the property line, is to have to preserve as many of the trees as we can have. There is going to be a retention pond towards the back of the property, but we will preserve as many trees as possible uh, to, to provide for privacy there. Uh, so it's going to be basically a place where guys come in, pick up their uh, equipment for the day, and get out and service uh, primarily homes and small businesses. And I'll jump ahead a little bit to, uh, to talk about the employer. Uh, they're they're uh, very aggressive in terms of uh, people with opportunities, government opportunities. They pay at a very competitive rate, twenty-seven forty-nine an hour. They've got one of the best affirmative action plans that you'll see, and I'll talk about that when we talk about the payments. Uh, so. Uh, glad to answer any questions, and Mike Dobson here can answer questions about. Uh, he did. He did go out to his site, attempt to talk to the administrator, but was unable to to get in touch with her. And nobody answered the door. So, he doesn't look too offensive or threatening. So. Any questions? Yes, sir. There's no amount of screen um, that can dampen the noise of a trash truck emptying a dumpster. From that building, I can work across. You can't take a nap, but okay. As long as you don't shake your head. Yeah, I knew. No That's why I was quiet. I'm like, uh oh, she's slipping. That's no good. Unloading with their their doors and dropping the <clears throat> ramp off the back of them. Would you guys be willing to rip commitments that said you wouldn't do that during certain hours? Like, the trash truck like to come when nobody's there early in the morning. I know these residents are going to like to get the trash and they don't have to buy a picture of money when they're going. I guess. So, would you guys be willing to commit to written commitment? I think we'd be willing to, to it? be willing to consider. I don't know what, like, what the time frames are. So, a semi truck yeah. coming in at seven o'clock at night is that, or a semi truck coming in at two in the morning? That, that would be disruptive to their, their, their homes, I think. Yeah. I can ask for that. I'm not going to commit to that because I don't think that that's, I think it needs to be broader hours for sure you guys come in. It's not pleasant to live next to the property. When you got, when you got close to the homeowner. Yeah. So yeah, that would be my request. Yeah. You guys come up with some kind of a written plan to deal with the noise when it comes to dumpsters and semis unloading. You say right across the street. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Go ahead. Thank you. Right across the street is the new fire station. Are there other commercial property next to that? I drive that every day. I should know. I'm right there. I'm throwing a blank. So we're, we're actually quite close to both industrial use and commercial use. Uh, so the fire station was, uh, that property was rezoned to allow the fire station. And then I think back here is like a parking area for a in general. Um, and then most of the homes, so we have the few in the pictures, but most of them don't front directly on McKinley. They're accessed from those collector streets like Coil Court and Sandus. Um, so we are close to amounts of industrial and commercial use. Uh, there's also kind of a commercial node where the new Culver, the Culver's is, if you go a little bit further down, that's visible standing there. It's like maybe in the picture I took out, but. And if you go back to that, right, right there. Yeah. If you can see too along the street, the homes that are here, uh, most of them are closer to the streets. There's there's a great bit of distance from the from that was formerly my, my political district, and, and I I've walked those neighborhoods before, and those yeah. people have some nice houses there, and I just know that noise will be an issue once that becomes commercially 
operational. So if there's a way you guys can de develop a noise reduction plan, then we hope that's okay. Our venture district now is going to my district. Questions, comments? Good night. I'd like to entertain a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? And that's my poor tax payment, sir. Sorry, the petitioner diversifies the real estate. Uh, Terry O'Brien, Economic Development Planner. My office is on the 11th floor of this building. We're talking about the same project that we just talked about 30 seconds ago. So I'm not going to go into great detail because the area plan already did. Mr. Augustine only did. I'm just going to add a few details that were not discussed. Um, Mr. Augustino mentioned that the 93 employees currently make $27.49 per hour on average. Um, 64% of those employees currently live in St. Joe County. Uh, due to that high percentage of employees living in St. Joe County, uh, the tenant is very confident that 100% of his 93 employees will follow. Um, once they have this larger facility and they have this training room, mm -hmm. they anticipate mm -hmm. being able to add an additional 28 or 18 employees with an average salary of approximately $28 an hour. Mr. Augustino and Mr. Dobson are happy to answer any additional questions that you might have. Any questions? <clears throat> Any no? I guess I'm good. So I'm sorry, uh, Mr. O'Brien, the tax fees and do we have any dollar amounts? Oh, okay, I see it. Some assessment. How much that will impact? And he has it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the estimated tax savings over 10 years would be $219,992. Estimated uh, real property taxes, which were extended out over a 20 year period, would be 853000 This is based on Steve Dalton's calculations. Is it 20 year real property? Yeah, 853000 Six times. Um, I also wanted to point out that the tenant is not seeking. Uh, any personal property tax abatement for the project is just a real property tax abatement. So any new equipment, any things that they do in the interior build out would be taxable. Not, not to mention there's $5 million of uh, projected income tax, which is subject to 1.75%. Thank you, County. Uh, but I, I also do want to emphasize something because in the past, been an important factor in terms of what kind of employer you're bringing in here. So I don't know if, if you've had distributed to you, I brought an extra copy, but there are, they have a, a minorities and women's affirmative action plan. They have a protected veterans affirmative action plan. They have individuals with those disabilities affirmative action plan. Uh, and it's one of the best plans that I've seen over the years because they take, they measure it. They take metrics to see how they're performing against their own measurements. Not to mention the fact that they've got a training center there. I think given its location not too far from Penn High School is a big plus as well uh, in terms of developing young men and women to perform in the grades. So uh, I think it's a positive, very positive uh, impact in terms of Quality employers coming to the area. There a motion. Thank 
I know it does. Uh, I do it every time. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. All second. Okay, who's doing it? I'll that? motion to sit favorably. Yeah. Yeah, I'll second. I don't even care. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Bill number 112-24, we don't properly locate north of 5253 for a row. Petitioner has either six, four lanes south end. Uh, same side as here. This is a request to rezone the northwest corner along State Road 23 for the property owned and used by St. Pius Church. As you can see from the zoning map, the currently um, property currently has multiple zoning districts. Along the frontage, the zones are from east to west. They're commercial, residential, office buffer and pink and then residential again. The intent of the rezoning is to make all of that front area commercially zoned. Yellow on this map, you can see the full extent of the property in the church. The um, majority of the larger church property is zoned R single family and the remainder would stay in that zoning district. Here's a closer look at the area to be rezoned. It is a portion of the parking lot and encompasses where the entrance is along State Road 23, going up to Santa Monica Drive to the west. Here's a view of that area. This is the other side of the frontage that's already zoned commercial, including the car wash, which is not owned by the church. Church property was renovated in 2015 for an addition, as well as the extension of that parking lot up to State Road 23. Use as a church is permitted under the R Single Family District and continue to be permitted under the commercial district if the request was approved. The nearby area is mainly commercial, specifically those types of commercial uses that typically function as services to residential neighborhoods. In August of this year, they applied for a variance for a larger monument sign along the access drive on State Road 23, but were denied by the Area Board of Zoning Appeals. The location of the sign they were proposing is in the area to be rezoned. No changes are proposed for the site other than adding a new sign. Here's a rendering they have submitted for that sign. This is slightly shorter in height than what they applied for in August with the BZA. Staff has reviewed the rezoning against state law criteria and find the request is appropriate given the surrounding area and the use as a church campus with several accessory uses. The Area Plan Commission sends this forward favorably 6-0, and I can answer any questions. Petitioner. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Ferricini. I live at 119 Barnes Court, Mishawaka. Uh, I'm the vice president of the parish council and I'm the strategic committee for the parish. Uh, as Fariel said, this is our, kind of our second time coming through with the BZA, um, which in, in kind of recollection and discussion with the church, I've seen more miscommunications between the county and, and the parish at the time of exactly what was the, trying to be established with the sign. Um, so now that uh, after further discussions with Fariel and Abby, and then after the recommend, recommendation of the BZA was to rezone to commercial, which fit the larger sign. So after multiple discussions, as I said, we adjusted our sign size slightly, which fits into the parameters of the commercial district. Uh, it will be 15 by nine, have the LED display uh, for communication and information relaying purposes. Um, the design height and stuff like that was met more or less match and character, the sign that is on Fur Road to kind of encompass the whole campus together. Um, and as you saw in one of the pictures, there was a Knights of Columbus sign that is standing that has already been removed. We did that. Uh, proactively because we knew that we wouldn't be able to have two signs on that frontage. So we went ahead and did that um, already, which I have told Abby and Fariel. <clears throat> the main purpose uh, for the parish's design for the sign comes from our, a lot of continuous growth in the parish community, also with an increased number of activities that the parish office uh, uh, offers. From Addicts Anonymous to weekend and evening adult sports leagues, parish festivals, Boy Scouts, food drives, Christmas gift drives for less fortunate children in the community, Mino Sopplers, the list can kind of go on and on. Uh, having said that, as I previously stated, we do have that monument sign up for road. Again, we just wanted to match, have that kind of uh, campus character. Um, as you guys probably know, for roads, two lane road, doesn't really have a shoulder, hard to get around people when they're turning into the parish and, and state, things like that and the businesses across the street. So we're trying to attempt with this sign is most of our traffic is now coming up 23. We're trying to not have traffic directed onto Fur Road, keep it on those highlighted um, State Road 23 entrances 
especially for people that are not familiar with the campus. They blow right by, they end up having to go down to Fur Road, turn in that way, much tougher access point. As I said, with that, it was two lane road on Fur Road. It just gets very congested, makes it hard for turning in, turning out, especially with school in the morning and things like that, uh, and uh, dismissal at the end of school. Um, as Ferriel stated, there's many commercial uses along Zero 23, <clears throat> multiple with very tall, very large signs with LED displays. <clears throat> Excuse me. We feel that our sign would not hinder the corridor at all and it would be appropriate for the amount of traffic that State Road 23 has. Um, there was a setback, parking setback variance that we did also have to apply for just because that the commercial zoning no longer, or our parking doesn't no longer fits in the commercial zoning. They were also approval, approval um, recommend approval of that and were favorable. Um, because it has really had no hindrance to any neighbors or anything um, with parking for the church. So um, other than that, I can answer any questions. Um, I was at your parish last Friday morning, and I, I know that you're a second time I've been there. You do need a sign out there, and I do appreciate what you've been doing with this. Like, you didn't get mad because right, they said right. no. You're doing it the correct way. Right, right, and I appreciate that. that. Yep, absolutely. And so if, I didn't, if somebody didn't, my first time I was there, I had a mic. GPS. I never. I right. Know. Right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. You got it. You mentioned on. No. Go ahead. Uh, just want to make it very clear. Okay. Uh, noted. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, you said people that are not familiar with Saint Pius or do these people live under a rock? <laughs> It's more people visiting new. So like if someone's going to do a funeral, wedding, sports <laughs> event, that's really more what it's geared towards. Yeah. The south side. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Not really a question, more of a comment. Just let Monsignor Hines know that based on what happened to you guys at the ABZA before I read the minutes of that meeting, some of the comments were made by the ABZA members were horrible. And I apologize on behalf of the county for what was said. It was inappropriate from the ABZA members and we probably placed some action. In their terms, come up after what they said that night, or that day, um, and I and I know that some of the information that was relayed uh, in the record that day was inaccurate about what was committed to the brief or so. Slip the lines in here. I'm not disappointed. It's not. It's not a reflection on all the county government, but we probably will make some make some appropriate changes at this time, going forward in the future, because that was totally uncalled for what was said about the church that night that day. Just kind of echo what Mark said. I was there and we lived through the comments. I was lost. I was shocked at the comments. Some of them very, even with the point of being anti religious, and I thought this, uh, this isn't this inappropriate. Um, so thank you, as Randy said, for sticking with it and get it done the right way. We're going to get some sign that's going to work. Thank you all. I get to appreciate the help of Abby and Ferriel. They've been wonderful. So thank you all. Any other comments? If not, in a motion. It's unfavorably. Second. Favorable. Second. All of those in favor say aye. Okay. Opposed? Motion for Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. President, that is all we're gonna next up on the agenda will be a so, presentation on the comprehensive plan, area plan. Uh, yeah. All right, Abby Wilds, Area Plan Commission Director. Uh, Department of IPG offices on the 11th floor. We are so pleased to be here before you tonight to do the presentation uh, in advance of your consideration of the resolution on the comprehensive plan for the November meeting. Uh, we, uh, I have Cynthia Bowen oh, here. here. <laughs> Our project manager from Rundle Ernstberger Associates or REA. It's been a long process, but uh, we are here with you with the resolution uh, that the area plan passed at the meeting last it went through uh, the resolution of certifying the plan and approving it went through 6-0. We had two members of the public speak in favor of it. So Cynthia is going to take you through an overview of the uh, process 
as well as uh, the overall plan structure. But before she gets going, I will just say that every public comment that we received during the 30 day public comment period was cataloged by us and then responded to in a public comment matrix that was uh, provided to you all. I have copies for any anyone that would like it, uh, any of the council members that would like to see it, but we took a lot of the considerations or a lot of the public comments into consideration and then made some changes during that period. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Cynthia. Yeah. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here tonight. We appreciate that. As Abby said, my name is Cynthia Bowen. I'm a partner at Rundell Onsberger and Associates, and I've been the project manager for this project through its duration. So tonight, I know it says seven things on here, but I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I just want to go through an overview of the process, talk a little bit about the numbers, people involved in the process, do a high-level review of the vision, goals, and the plan organization, talk a little bit about the future land use map, go over the priority area map, discuss the implementation metrics and how that works, and then answer any questions that you might have about presentation or the plan. I see some of you brought your plans tonight, so that's great. So this has been almost a three-year process that we've gone through. Um, we've gone through a five-phased approach, starting with the discovery phase and working our way all the way across to now we are in the adoption phase. And as I said, each going through each part of this phase, whether it's the discovery, the visioning, framework, or action, we have had public involvement all the way through this process, um, whether it be through in-person public meetings or we have had a website that has taken online um, comments as well as had online activities for the public to be involved. So what is a comprehensive plan? Well, a comprehensive plan really is that collective vision for the future growth of your community. It is a plan that is a guide that tells you how to grow in terms of the location, the quantity, and the type of growth that you wanna see over the next 20 years. And it really provides, it's that relationship between the community's future vision and kind of private property rights, private and regulation of property. So zoning and the subdivision ordinance. So why do we create a comprehensive plan? So first off, we want to make sure that we're operating, we're all operating from the same vision, from the same place, whether it's the staff who's using it, the plan commission, you as the council or the county commissioners, or even developers. So as the petitions that you heard tonight. So everybody knows what the county expects of them when it comes to growth and development. We want to make sure that the vision and the goal, that vision is supported by goals. So you know how to, what you need to spend your money on, how that, what roads, what utilities, what other resources need to be allocated for over the next 20 years. As I indicated, there are maps that identify where the land uses occur. But most importantly, this is a policy guide. It is not a regulatory document. And the guide should be used as a living document to change as the conditions in the county change. And most importantly, this document really provides the basis for future grant funding. So as, you know, whether it's your police and fire, whether it is um, Abby or Sky or Bill going after other things to get you grants, the first thing that they're going to ask as part of that grant funding is, do you have a comprehensive plan and when was it created and is what you're going after in your comprehensive plan? So let's talk a little bit about by the numbers. So we've had more than 50 in-person virtual meetings and we've had um, two open houses recently held on August 28th. We've had more than 800 Something citizens. Oh, please try again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she always says that. Just set her down here. We had more than 800 citizens participate in this um, process. 
71 participants in that um, August 28th meeting that we had that was an open house. We've had more than 4,900 views on the website and 105 views most recently when we posted the document plan on the website. We had over 1,800 public comments throughout this entire process. We had 178 comments which were submitted regarding the draft document that Abby was just talking about that her and her staff made comments back to. So one of the things that we did at the um, open house was ask the public to prioritize a series of action steps. So after the plan was adopted, the staff knew you know, what do we need to do immediately to get started? So some of the top boat getters were looking at exploring zoning incentives to protect environmentally sensitive areas. So that was the number 26 up there. The number 19 was looking at developing an inventory of septic dependent subdivisions to understand the future viability of septic systems and to provide, to prioritize sewer connection projects. Number 14 up there, which was developing two agricultural zoning districts, one focused on intensive ag and one focused on general ag. And then the last one, we had a couple up there with 12s. And so focusing on revitalization and redevelopment of critical mm -hmm. corridors and coordination of zoning and development to ensure design standards in the zoning ordinance reflect the desired character of areas in the county. So those were the top things that they're saying that the staff and the county need to work on once this plan is implemented. Now, from some of the comments that we received, these were some of the revisions that we made to the plan. We looked at in extending the environmentally sensitive overlay to cover additional areas of concern, some additional environmentally sensitive areas, some of the lakes. We reworded a recommendation to emphasize priority growth area as opposed to growth boundaries. We ensured the incorporated and unincorporated areas and communities were correctly identified and discussed in the plan. We updated, really updated goals in the utilities to allow more flexibility in the treatment systems regarding alternative treatment systems. We revised a housing goal to broadly support the development of newer housing units, so both owner and renter occupied. And then we added a recommendation because we realized we didn't have a recommendation that was really addressing small business resources and support. So we added that in the economic development section. So in terms of the vision goals and the plan organization, this is the overall vision statement for the county. So St. Joseph County is a thriving, diverse community with high quality hometowns and is focused on economic development, responsible growth and sustainable development that respects the area's natural features and its rural character. So we have eight different goals or eight different pillars that support that vision. We've taken that vision and broken it down into smaller chunks that these then re reference or support that vision and with guiding principles and describe how that vision needs to be implemented over the next 20 years. So as you can see in this graphic here, we have the vision, which is overarching. We have a series of guiding principles. Then we have the land use and development character, which spans broadly over each of those pillars. Then you see we have the eight pillars of economic development, housing and neighborhoods, quality of life and place, environmental stewardship, farmland preservation, governance and policy, transportation and utility. So each one of those pillars has a series of goals in it, anywhere from three to five goals. And then each of those goals has recommendations to them. So these are, um, and I'm not gonna go through and read all these to you. 
These are the different pillars. And as you can see there, um, the, the variety of goals. So economic development has four goals. Housing and neighborhoods has three goals. Quality of life and place has three, as does environmental stewardship. So again, you know, thinking about the things of enhancing your quality of life and place and um, protecting your environmental resources. Farmland preservation, um, protecting the land and connecting with um, farmers to training and support, a government and policy, making sure that development is well planned and um, communicating and planning with your adjacent jurisdictions. Transportation has six goals. And so this is really making sure we're a multimodal community. We're promoting connectivity within our county ordinances and standards. We're planning for active transportation and planning investments with our partners to really leverage our funds. In the utilities, again, we're making sure we're uh, collecting and analyzing information. So we're making data-driven decisions. We're reducing our overall dependence on on-site water and wastewater septic, you know, septic systems and making sure we're providing utilities in a manner or pursuing utilities in a manner that protects the public health and natural areas. So we also have a future land use and development character map. And so this is what this looks like. So each one of these colors represents a different thing on the map. So, and I don't think that the pointer works. So let me kind of point these out to you. So the light green areas that you see right here are the general agricultural areas. The dark green areas that you see right here are the intensive agricultural areas or you know what we would call the prime farmland ag, ag areas. The dark green that you see here are the parks and recreation, parks and conservation areas. The all the yellow that you see in here are the low density residential. And then we do have some orange in here that are the medium density residential, where you're gonna have a variety of um, residential densities. Then we do have a couple of high density residential areas. And again, these are mostly gonna be along your corridors. So along 23, um, we think, I think we have a couple on um, going out on two. Then we do have a mixed density area. So this area right up in here, so we allow for a mix of residential types and a mix of densities there. And so we have another pocket um, right here as well. Then the institutional uses, which are gonna be schools, churches, things like that, you're gonna find those in the kind of royal blue color. Mixed uses are gonna be in the kind of light pink areas, which is kind of hard to see on the screen here. Um, so those are gonna be your things that are gonna be commercial with residential office and commercial office and residential. So that mix of use, so it could be horizontal or vertical. Your red is going to be light commercial. And again, you're gonna find those along your corridors. Your general commercial is going to be your deeper red again, along your uh, corridors. Your light industrial is this purple that you see here out and around the IEC. And you also have some heavy industrial, mostly around here and down along 23. And then we do identify some transitional areas along 23, along 931. These areas are in transition meaning that they're transitioning from one use to another and that further study is needed for them. We've also then identified some special areas. So floodplains are noted on the map because development is often limited in those areas. We have areas of environmentally sensitive areas, which are these areas that you're gonna see that are hashed right here. We have a question. Oh, yeah. what, what is that plan? Because that's goes right to my house. I can see it right there. So what 
So right, so right now, what that means is that we just need to pay closer attention to development in that area because there are environmentally sensitive features. And so one of the recommendations in the plan is that we eventually um, develop an overlay district that might provide protection, further protection for environmentally sensitive features. So that could include maybe setbacks, additional setbacks from environmental features. Um, so whether it be wooded areas, wetland areas, um, ponds, things like that. Okay, you're welcome. So the infill areas are gonna be the areas that are gonna be striped and brown. And most of that is over on this side, on the west side of the county. And then we have an area of business, technology, and research park, which you see is this striped area that are on top of kind of the IEC here and over in this area here. So all of this, this land use map then guides future growth and future development. So when someone wants to develop their land, they come in, they talk to the staff, they look at the land use map to see if the land use and what they wanna do is compatible with that. Now, if it's not, it doesn't mean that it's stuck in stone. You can always make amendments to the land use map. That's why it's called a guide because things and conditions change over time. And so you may after, again, on further study, or on Capitol Avenue, we've recommended some additional study along that area. There may need to be an update to, or an amendment to the comprehensive plan once that study is completed. And that is perfectly okay. It doesn't mean what we've done the past three years has been for naught, and it doesn't mean, you know, in air, it just means the conditions and changes along that corridor and further study was done to get more in detail of what was needed for that corridor to provide more advanced guidance. Yes. Um, I was I was going to wait till you were done, but I, I just can't. That's okay. Uh, the way you just your your narrative is so on point as far as this document being a living document mm -hmm. and quote unquote a guide. Mm -hmm. Okay, that can be amended along the way. And if we, and I mean all of us, we need to do a better job of making sure that the public understands this. Mm -hmm. this is because there's been way too much work and excellent work put into this process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I went to the open houses, the open houses and <laughs> walked in and didn't know what to expect. I was overjoyed that. They, there was a decision to even have those. And when I walked in and saw the process mm -hmm. and the interaction and the prioritizing of everything, I, I almost faint. I'm serious. It, it, to me, it's been done. Couldn't have been better. Mm -hmm. So if we don't get this across to our constituents that this is not a stone because I've heard too many times at too many meetings that when it goes against the comprehensive plan, but I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to say. Right. Matter of fact, I wish more people would come and get involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, regardless of if I agree with them or not, is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the time and work that has been put into this process is outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you can also thank your staff. Your staff has put a lot of time and effort into this and making oh, and this I very well know that. <laughs> yeah. So when you're talking about intensive versus general agriculture, is the main difference that one is prime farmland and the other isn't the main? Mm -hmm. It's more that more of that is where, yes, it's more where the rich soils are um, for the farming. And it's more intensive in terms of farming out in those areas. Mm -hmm. Richer soils go with the intensive. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. Let's see here. There we go. 
So the other thing that we've done in the plan is we've broken the plan or we've broken the land use map down into township by township maps. So people can really go in and see the detail of what we're doing. So we'll have an existing land use map that shows what is physically on the ground. Now, again, this is a snapshot a, t a point in time in which it was taken, and then what the future land use is. So the farther we get out from when we took that snapshot, you know, changes will occur. So, and this is why I say this has to be a living, breathing document because, you know, changes are going to occur even on the ground from what the existing land use is. But we provide this more detailed view. So we also provide narrative with these about um, things to look out for, other significant plans to um, look into and to connect with and to take into consideration when making decisions about land uses in that particular area. So the other thing that we did with this plan is we created what was called the priority areas map. Again, you have a big wide county that you have to provide resources for and your budget can't go for everything. You can't do a scatter shot on um, infrastructure and that kind of like to maintain the county. And so what we did was we tried to take um, what we had in the plan and prior to prioritize it. So in each pillar, we created a priority map. So in economic development, in residential, in parks, in agriculture, in the corridors, in transportation, we created a priority area map that provides additional guidance on where resources should be targeted over the next 20 years. So whether that's staff resources, whether that's monetary resources, whether that's you know whatever type of resources the county has, this is where they would be focused. So we go into further detail into the chapter about what those priority areas mean, you know, what those call outs mean. And again, like in the transportation section, when we have some of those, call, those corridors highlighted, you know, indicating that again on Capitol Avenue that we need to do further study because the conditions have changed since the last time the plan that corridor plan was updated. Then we've created an overall, we've taken all of those layers and then layered them onto themselves. Because again, one of the things that you wanna keep in mind is if you're funding some type of transportation improvement, you wanna take into account maybe something else that's going on out here, out in the IEC and try to leverage all of the benefits are all the things that you're trying to do out there. You know, whether it's making a transportation improvement and you want to include, um, I don't know, a rail spur, or you want to include some other interchange or something like that, along that you can capitalize and leverage those benefits and build on top of other grants that you have going on there. So this is why we have the priority areas map and they're all layered. So you can really take advantage of that and build upon those resources. So the final thing that we have in the plan is the implementation matrix. And so what we've done is kind of two things. We have put it together um, by the, each pillar and then we put three things in it. We have put in the time frame. So, you know, short term needs to happen in less than five years. Midterm happens in the next five to 10 years. Long term, we're talking 10 years out. And then there are going to be some activities that are going to be ongoing that you need to do every time. We also have a level of importance, whether it's, you know, a low level importance or something that's high that we think needs to get done immediately. And then there's the level of difficulty. There may be something that's really low hanging fruit, or there may be something that is a level four that, you know, we know this is important to do, but it re we really don't have the political will at this point in time to be able to get this to do, to do this, or we don't have the public support behind it to be able to get this done. So clearly, if you have something that is a number high level, 
but a level four, it's going to take you a long time to be able to get that done. Good question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned priorities. Mm -hmm. You mentioned level of importance. Mm -hmm. A, who sets the priorities? B, who's deciding what the level of importance is? Okay, so um, the staff and our consultant team work together to identify the level of importance and the level of difficulty or the level of priority. Where you all come in is now, once the plan is adopted, mm -hmm. it will be up to the council and the plan commission to, be, to set kind of their work plans from what's in the comprehensive plan to figure out what you might want to chunk off and tell the staffs, this is what we think you need to work on. You know, we see these priorities here, but this is what we think you need to work on. This is where we need to put our resources because you are the fiscal agent. You guys control that budget and you say, this is where we need to, this is where we need to spend our resources. Try to be a more clear. So let's just take level of importance. Okay. How did you and the staff decide how many stars something would get with the level of importance? How did you decide? So we decided trying to get down to okay. where, who's making these decisions and what. So we decided this through um, what we heard in focus groups, conversations that we've had with council members. Um, conversations that we had um, that we've had generally as a staff, um, conversations that we've heard from public meetings. So we take all of that into account and then also our own experience in working in other communities. So all of that goes into how we label that. Abby. And I should say, and the county commissioners, because we also talked with county commissioners and the task force. So, Abby, can you clarify how you got our input? I know I talked to you a couple of times in your office mm -hmm. about the plan. Is that where you got, you gauged my, what I thought was most important? Did you do the same thing as everybody else? I mean, how did you come up with what we as a... We held briefings with all of you uh, earlier this year to go over the plan and the recommendations. You couldn't make the one that we scheduled or that you were scheduled. Yeah, so I had to come. Uh, then I would say when Cynthia says staff, I would broaden staff to be IPG mm -hmm. and yes. also beyond because like, you know, a lot of the recommendations as it relates to uh, water and sewer, like wastewater, you know, involve the health department. So I would say staff more broadly than just area plan, you know, area plan, IPG and uh other staff in the county that would have to weigh in. Here we go. And then this is what the implementation looks like, or ma implementation matrix looks like. So you have all the recommendations down the side here, organized by goal. You have the time frame. you have the level of difficulty, you have kind of the level of importance. And then you have, the folks that are going to be involved in implementing that particular recommendation. So it doesn't, so it doesn't necessarily always fall on the county proper to get these things pushed through. It also or it also relies on other organizations, maybe other communities, other towns, other organizations to help implement some of these things just as they were all involved in the creation of this plan. That is the end of the presentation. So I'm more than happy to go back to any section, answer any questions you have. Yeah, I'm just doing quick. Could you go back to the last? Yes, I can. I guess that's that right there is another reason why I'm so impressed with this entire process. I mean, when you talk about everybody involved, not just the public input, but when I look there, look up there and see redevelopment commission, South Bend Regional Chamber, City mm -hmm. of Mishawaka, Maycob, Town of New Carlisle. I mean, you know, I just think that's great. So they were all involved in the task that, force. That's the point. Yes. Helping us. And they went all through these recommendations with us. That's exactly yes. the thing. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Piggybacking mm -hmm. what Mr. Morton said earlier about uh, 
wanting the public to know that this school is a guide. You made the comment, and I, I, I want to just clarify just to make sure that I heard you correctly. This presentation. You said comprehensive plan is a guide, and you could, Raphael used the word amend. I thought yeah. I heard you say deviate. That we could deviate from it at times? Or at times? Yeah. Yeah. At times we could deviate from comprehensive mm -hmm. plan mm -hmm. as an elected body? Mm -hmm. Did you say that? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said deviate. I want to make sure. It's a we're, not not really we're not, we're we're not legally bound. Not. No, I know that. Yeah, I, yeah I, it's, a, it's a guide. So you, you see that other jurisdiction? Sir? Yes. Yeah. Because again. Yeah. So remind us all. You're deviating. <laughs> so, well, what I like to tell. In theory, yeah, yeah. I would love all of my communities to amend their comprehensive plan so it continues to okay. be a living and breathing document, but um, they get caught up in all of the day-to-day -day that it's hard to constantly amend. I mean, it's easier for them to amend their zoning code and keep up with that than it is to also amend their, comp you know, they will do instead every couple of years will do an amendment. You know, we put in here as one of the top ongoing actions is that it should be reviewed on a periodic basis. And you know, Abby should be uh, providing a staff report to the plan commission, to the council on the implementation of the comprehensive plan. So, you know, kind of you have some benchmarks of how this is being implemented and when, you know, how far and how much change has occurred. So you know when maybe we need to do a minor amendment, a minor modification to the plan. But yes, most communities do deviate from their plan. And I would rather say than we modify. even have the example locally that uh, maybe we haven't amended the comprehensive mm -hmm. plan that existed before this one mm -hmm. gets uh, uh, but we've supplemented. Yes. It's been an IEC area uh, plan. Yes. There's been a Capitol Avenue corridor plan. Um, this document is for grant pursuit mm -hmm. or if the park system wanted to do a comprehensive trail plan for MACOG mm -hmm. uh, for a trail plan within the community um, and things of that nature, right? So like this yes. is the foundation on which those additional plans can be built. Yes. And that's why this uh, comprehensive plan is a longer stretching term then like a parks plan is typically every five years every five years yeah. right so it that is something that's going to update more frequently but still be built upon the foundation of the comprehensive plan exactly you got it this is the foundation document for your community and again we have recommendations in there to update your parks five-year plan you know that's why i said the capitol avenue plan you already have one but it's out of date and again, that's an area that needs a little bit more attention and detail, and it's not appropriate to go into that level of detail in the comprehensive plan. So yes, you would amend this plan by creating that detailed sub-area plan. And then ultimately what you would do is when that plan is finished and accomplished, you would just amend it as, a uh, as a component of the comprehensive plan. That's all you would do. I did have a couple uh, questions as a follow-up. I don't know if it would be quite a few slides back. It was toward the beginning. You okay. had, uh, I think, 121 participants mm -hmm. in uh, ranking uh, particular areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what does that 121 votes represent? Are those individual people? Is that the uh, is that the uh, the group that uh, coalesced? around this i forget the exact term that we called that um, so it was the people who attended the focus group or i'm sorry the people that attended the open houses um over those two um those two, those days. two yes those two periods um and they it was their votes and then uh there were roughly 800 participants overall in the process mm -hmm. um and the the responses from those individuals were collected uh, mm -hmm. whether they were in person or digital, I believe. Mm -hmm. and, and that went to inform what these pillars and focus areas are, correct? Yes. Or, um, I, I've asked you this question whenever we had kind of the preview several months ago. That's okay. Uh, and 
I, I don't know that it was necessarily resolvable, but do we know where those people came from geographically? And was there any methodology to geographically weight the importance of some of these focus areas? So no, we don't know geographically where, you know, I think we were, we're able to know where some people came from because Abby knows, you know, a lot of folks in the county. Um, so, but in terms of, explain to me again, your geographical weighting of the pillars. So if there were a lot of people focused on the IEC area yes. uh, and they lived in New Carlisle um, and we just didn't get responses from other people, that would make sense. But if there's a massive focus on uh, that area in the transportation plan and things of that nature, then is that influenced by those people in, in a way that is not weighted against uh, participation at the rest of the county? Or because we've had so many projects, investments in that part of the county, did we have an outweighted participation as a whole from folks in New Carlisle and Olive Township that may have influenced the outcome of the comprehensive plan? Uh, as a whole. I, I'm not suggesting that that's what's happened, but right. that's the basis of my question. So we try to be um, very diligent, as we are with any process that we do, to make sure that we're representing all viewpoints. And so, and that we're not um, having the DAC stacked in one way or another, that, um, that it's try to evenly disperse the opinion so that we can get and even opinion. And so, um, you know, whether it's the IEC, whether it was farmland, you know, we try to make sure we have subject matter experts who um, are experts in that particular field um, who are working here in the county that can give us that, um, give us that viewpoint. You know, most certainly we had people um, from New Carlisle who um, weighed in on the IEC um, we also had other people who um, didn't live in the area who weighed in on the IEC. We had economic development experts who weighed in. So we had vast viewpoints that were, that had a broad range, you know, for that, you know, on that particular topic. Same thing for environmental, same thing for um, farmland. We tried to do that with each of the pillars making sure that we were evenly dispersed and represented, not by over-representation of one group or the other. Abby, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I would say, you know, part of why we had a slightly longer process than what was desired yes. initially is because we had input that was uh, heavily weighed in the early stages of the planning process, and then we had to work to broaden input collected. So the plan that you're seeing here today really is a, a balanced approach to development in the county. Very quick, Grace. Real quick to tag off what Brian said. So of the 121, were any of those people people from outside the county? Are you saying some of the people in that 121 were from outside the county? They were so the 121 that are showing on this slide were the attendees of the mm -hmm. open houses that we held on August 28th. Uh, were people from the county. I I have to go through each one on the sign-in sheet to be able to say where they came from, but it's actually 119 because me, me and Mr. Fig me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think the vast majority clarify, were I from the county. The words outside the area, but I think it was in reference to outside the IEC. Area, yes, outside, outside the IEC. The Yes, that's what I was when I said when I met outside the area. I met outside New Carlisle, outside the IEC, not outside the county. You said experts in different fields, and I, I thought, well, if those are people we count in the one twenty one, experts in different fields aren't always going to be from St. Joe County. No, when she made the comment about experts in different fields, when we had working groups for the various pillars, we had folks like AEP from uh, for, on the utilities from INDOT that may or may not live in the county. But uh, yeah, the, I think uh, I hate to speak off the cuff because uh, I'd like to look at those sign-in sheets to verify, but I knew two thirds of the people that came to the open house just in my role here. And I think were these are these are kind of the same people that kind of the same people that were always. I mean, I know we had broad 
different people getting involved, but I still, a lot of these people are the same people that were kind of obsessed with their public certain issues. Task force participants and things of that nature. Well, like IEC people or real, I mean, you can tell that there are a lot of environmentalists. I mean, I don't know that, like that number is very reflective of, of everybody. Yeah, because... and this is just, you know, some selected, uh, we select in terms of like this exercise for the open house, this is, uh, I guess, recommendations that were selected by staff and the consulting team to ask for input on. It's not, it's kind of like a sample, a public sampling to show you what people are interested in, but it didn't affect, I, this didn't translate exactly to the prioritization right. in the implementation table. Right. I mean, overall public input did, but not this particular exercise. This is showing you the results from the last round of the public open houses that we held. I think Strait makes a great point. If you look at that 26, I can guarantee you, if you go into my district and ask 121 people what their priorities would be, and the number one priority will not be exploring zoning incentives to protect environmentally sensitive areas. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they come and make their voices heard? There's certain groups that make their voices heard in these things, and there's most people that don't pay any attention. Yes, I mean, that is He's not going to do any better than that. Well, they're not paying. I just said that is really required. And the sandwich is really required. I mean, what more can you do in a situation like this well, when you're asking for public input? I'm just saying. But I think of the 800 participants and over the course of the few years, the engagement opportunities that existed, the the locations that were chosen were mindful from my recollection that mm -hmm. uh, that the activities and the engagement was throughout the county yes. and that there was a concerted effort to get that input from the various geographic units. I don't want to speak in defense of it necessarily, but I think that's just a matter of fact. You are correct. So just for clarification, this chart is a mere sampling of right. what was prioritized by our public in the public open houses. This particular chart is not part of the plan itself correct. that is in front of you today. That is correct. Anything else from the council? Next step are adoption. Yeah. <laughs> so back up to Amy. Uh, the the uh, legislative body uh, can now adopt plan by resolution, which will make it go into effect for the county. Uh, this wasn't required today. Uh, public hearing isn't required, but I don't know if you're going to do so at the November well, hearing. Public hearing matters that are substantial in resolutions. I believe we should always have the public hearing. Here we go. Great. Great. So the action would be uh, grand the adoption by resolution. The very pleasure to it. Last. I mean, that's the ideal next step that the, the public meeting uh, coming up after the public hearing of the public you all want to have. Uh, and if you're going to have a public hearing, you're going to need to publish it like any other item for that. So, yeah, uh, approval by resolution would be the ideal next step. <laughs> else? Thank you for coming tonight. With that, that's all I've got. So we are through. Um, you get a lot of emails on the for you. Now it's scheduled for a little. I don't know if that's written.